Welcome, everybody. Um, we have folks still joining. Thank you all for coming in. And as you're, uh, as you're joining, please continue to introduce yourself by dropping your name, state affiliate, or co congregational affiliation, or if you have one, uh, or the location in the chat. It's fun to see folks from all over. I see Minnesota, Texas, Wisconsin, Montana, Kentucky, Ohio, North Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, South Dakota, more Pennsylvania, Seattle, Missoula, Indiana. Welcome. Keep keep them coming. Kansas, Oregon. It's fun. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, we, I'm excited to have uh, all of IPL's advocacy team here joining us today, um, and our team is going to walk through, share what what's uh, what we th is sort of on our per perspective of what's next for climate policy this year. Uh, we're going to share our IPL policy priorities priorities um, and some ways that you can get involved. So um, we've got working on the uh, on our agenda today. Um, we, we're going to give a background of the policy landscape um, and talk about some of the policy levers that we see as opportunities um, so opportunities this year um, and some of the main ones, the big ones that IPL National will be working on. Um, and there are, will, are additionally, of course, other advocacy efforts that we'll be working on um, that we're not able to cover all today. Um, and we'll, some areas that we'll be supporting in, sim in smaller or less, less involved ways, but we'll, because we only have an hour with you all today. We're pressed to squeeze in what we've got here. So uh, we'll be working to cover that. See more folks joining. Thanks for dropping your dropping where you're from in your chat. It's great to see the folks from really all over and affiliates on congregations around the country. So a note on housekeeping, you'll see there's a Q&A button on your screen um, and uh, you can ask where, because there's so many folks in the, uh, we're asking you know, on here and lots of questions, we're asking you direct, if you have questions for us, direct those to the Q&A and we'll get to those later in the call instead of the chat because the chat just gets a little uh, unwieldy to track those. Um, and we'll also note that we're, we're, we are recording it uh, and we'll send those uh, a link out of the recording to everybody along with all the links that we share during this webinar in the chat. Uh, so you should have those uh, by tomorrow at the latest. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to our federal policy manager, Madison Mayhew, who will kick us off and share some context of the moment that we're in policy-wise this year. Thanks, Tiffany. It's great to see all of you. Um, as mentioned, my name is Madison Mayhew. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the federal policy manager for IPL. Um, to set the stage for 2024, it's important to provide some context to understand where we are and what brought us here. Um, as you may recall, back in 2021, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, also known as EJA, was signed into law, which was followed by the Historic Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, in 2022. Both ushered in the largest investments in climate and clean energy in our nation's history. A huge focus for us and for many of our partners is ensuring that the implementation of these massive bills are not only successful, but also equitable. It's clear that the IRA's success, its effectiveness in driving down emissions hinges on consumers, houses of worship, and business, really all of us, um, hearing about and seizing the opportunity that these incentives and rebates offer. Through these programs, um, the administration has really shown that climate action leads to prosperity for all of us. If we could go back to the previous slide, please. <laughs> um, uh, but we know that the clock is ticking and the job is not done. Um, as my colleague will point out in just a moment, there are ways that the administration can take further action to help us reach our climate goals and promote environmental justice through regulatory action. And then as we talk about uh, legislative priorities in a minute, keep in mind that this year is a big election year, which will likely impact Congress's ability to pass legislation after August. Usually by fall, members in both chambers and parties are distracted by primaries, fundraising, and the demands of campaigning. Um, Congress typically decamps for much of the fall prior to the general election in November, which shortens our timeline to pass meaningful legislation. 
And then lastly, COP29 later this year will have huge implications for international climate finance commitments. Although we won't be spending our time today talking about our plans for COP, know that our strategy for advancing strong climate action at COP um, and through an international climate lens um, influences our work throughout the year. Uh, so now I will turn it over to my colleague, Bill Bradley, our Senior Organizing Director, to speak about um, administrative opportunities uh, available to us. Thanks, Madison. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about the administrative levers. And if you're here to talk about administrative levers, then you are my people. So I appreciate you being here. I want to give a little bit of background. Um, when I say, or when we say, rules, standards, regulations, safeguards, we mean the same thing, all of those. We mean the same thing by them. We use them kind of interchangeably. When you think about administrative law, um, this is a law where uh, the administration uh, grants authority delegated from Congress to an agency like the EPA. And there's expertise in that agency. So you think about you would probably rather have a group of scientists making a decision about clean air than you would your congressperson. And so that congressperson through the law has granted the authority. And these are the administrative levers that we're talking about today. So the first one up, power plants. Next slide. Can we go to the next one? Having some technical difficulties. That there we go. All right, there we go. Okay, so you can see the list of power plant rules that we're looking at. You can see the ones that are final, the ones that are not final yet, that we still have a chance to weigh in on. Um, this is a big deal. Um, currently about 60% of our electricity comes from burning fossil fuels. Uh, it's the second biggest uh, source of carbon pollution in the United States. If anyone can guess what the first biggest uh, source of carbon in the United States is, put it in the chat. Um, and and uh, the Biden administration, as you may know, set a goal of creating a, part, a carbon pollution-free power sector by 2035. The EPA has a key role to play in this work. And that's what you see here with these rules that we've been working on for the past few years that we'll continue to work on. Next slide. Methane, I wanna talk about this. Um, and here again, when we say methane, we also say natural gas. We're talking about the same thing. Natural gas is a fossil fuel. It's mostly composed of methane. These rules are really important because methane has a, a much stronger global warming potential than carbon dioxide in the short term. So the work that we can do to stop methane from getting into the atmosphere can have a really uh, outsized impact in the near term. And there's good news here. The EPA final rule was just issued last month. Nearly 1 million comments came from the public. Thank you for everyone who commented. We worked on that for many months. The rule is really a big deal um, because of that ability to uh, address climate change by addressing methane that traps so much heat. A um, few things about this rule. One is that it addresses new and existing sources of methane. That's a big deal because in the past, the um, older existing oil and gas infrastructure wasn't addressed. It is addressed in this rule. That's where a majority of the methane pollution is coming from. So it's very important. Another important thing to point out with this rule is that it also uh, reintroduces a social cost of carbon at $190 a ton. This is important because this applies across the spectrum. When these rules are enacted, there, there has to be a cost benefit. And by putting a cost on carbon at $190 a ton, we at least say you can't just simply pollute the atmosphere, throw your trash into the air, uh, and have no cost to it. We're putting a cost behind that uh, that is a little bit more science-based than it has been in the past. Another important thing about the methane rule is um, Hopefully you heard a couple of years ago at the big UN climate conference, there was a 155 country agreement on a global methane pledge. It aims to cut uh, global methane emissions by 30%. Uh, and 
by having the U.S. take part in this rule, we set the stage for other countries to also be able to take part and support their efforts to cut meth methane and to cut it globally. So a few facts about the rule. Um, it removes 58 million tons of methane from the atmosphere. Um, it reduces methane from covered sources by about 80%. So again, that's even more significant because methane is such a big contributor to climate change. It also reduces um, other important things like volatile organic compounds and hazardous air pollutants. And this is important because part of the work that we're doing is really looking at protecting the vulnerable communities that are the front lines of the oil and gas industry. And so these people um, are breathing all of this pollution in addition to the methane, and we're reducing that as we reduce the methane. And this is simply methane that is being wasted, that is, that is leaking from infrastructure and being wasted and going into the atmosphere. What's next with this? Well, it's really important for all of you that are here today because the next part of this is that it shifts to the states. And so the states and the tribes are going to be looking at implementation plans over the next two years, and there'll be more opportunities for action, and we will keep you alerted of those as they happen. But I wanted to bring that up uh, because a lot of that work will shift to the states, and with our state affiliates around the country, we have a real opportunity to work at the state level and make sure that we have strong state level plans. Um, I also wanted to touch base on a couple of other important things with methane. Um, the methane emissions reduction plan, the draft plan was just released a couple weeks ago, um, and we expect a 40 day comment period to be coming up soon. Um, we will keep you alerted. We'll send an action alert about that so that you can comment. Very important for us to get comments in to let them know that we want a strong methane emis emissions reduction plan. Um, and this plan is a fee on any leaked and therefore wasted methane from the oil and gas industry. And so we wanna look at a strong plan there that makes sure that takes into account that any of this leaking methane is just wasted and we don't wanna be wasting this. Moving on to, let me touch base on one last thing here, which is the BLM methane rule that's mentioned there. Um, that is still in process and we'll let you know more about that as we find out more and there's an opportunity for action. So moving on to clean vehicles. Tiffany, how am I doing on time? Um, I think you're okay. Keep going. Okay. All right. Yeah. Great. All right. Moving on to vehicles. If you guessed that um, transportation is the number one source of carbon pollution in the United States, you are correct. Um, so very important sector for us to work on um, transportation and vehicles. A um, couple of things here right at the top. Uh, last, late last spring, there were two important rules introduced. One was from the National Highway Tra Traffic Safety Administration, and this was on fuel economy. So, you know, how many miles per gallon your, your gas vehicle gets if you were riding in a gas vehicle. Uh, this rule uh, will raise the fuel economy of new vehicles 18% by 2032 model year. And then a second rule that's harmonized with this one is from the EPA, and this is on emissions. So the first one is on fuel economy. The second one is on emissions, pollution out of that tailpipe in your gas vehicle or hybrid vehicle. Uh, this also came out uh, about the same time late last spring. The EPA released the proposed rule to reduce emissions from light and heavy duty vehicle models from the years 2027 to 2032. Uh, the light duty standards for passenger cars and trucks would cut carbon emissions from tailpipes up to 69% compared to the 2026 model year. So this is a big deal. Unfortunately, the proposed rule for the heavy duty isn't quite as strong as we would like it, and we're continuing to push and try to make that rule stronger. These rules right now are in the draft stage. We expect the final rules come spring. Um, I also want to talk about, before we go on to forests, I want to talk about um, state rules. Uh, this is really important because California Air Resources Board adopted a new set of clean car standards known as Advanced Clean Car 2 or ACC2. 
um, that covers model year 2026 and beyond. So uh, California um, for almost 50 years now has been able to set their own standard for clean cars because of the pollution that's happened in California. And the EPA we're now waiting on to grant a waiver under the Clean Air Act um, to allow California to continue. And each year for almost 50 years, this has happened. Um, the important part of this in addition is that 13 states plus uh, the District of Columbia have also adopted this rule. And so they too are following the California standards for clean cars rules. Um, so we're, we're uh, working uh, to make sure that the EPA grants this waiver and that there is no delay because any delay uh, slows the states from implementing the rule and it weakens the benefits um, to the public for both health and climate. All right, moving on to old growth and mature forests. The U.S. Forest Service nationwide forest plan amendment um, it could better protect and strengthen the country's old growth forests, addressing the threats to them and conserving them as a natural climate solution. So there we're looking at really trying to protect uh, old growth and mature forests. There's a real concern about forest fires, but with old growth and mature forests, uh, they are natural forests that are naturally fire resistant. So we want to make sure that there's protection for those and that people aren't able to use the excuse of concern about fire as a reason to cut these old growth trees that are really valuable. Next slide, um, just a, an image for you to take a look at these trees and to think about why we're doing the work that we're doing. This is from, that was from Northern California and the coastal redwoods. Okay, how you can help with this is the same as the, how you can help with the legislation. Um, it's just that often the administrative rules are a little more behind the scenes uh, and as important as they are, a lot of the public isn't aware of them. So the work that you can do is, is certainly uh, paying attention when we have an action alert and trying to get those comments in. Every comment helps. Every comment that we get in there makes a difference. So please look out for the upcoming action alerts that give you an opportunity to comment, but also talking to friends and family about these things. People don't hear about these. I don't suggest maybe starting with administrative levers, but you can start with, do you care about clean air? And talk to them about some of these things that, that you know about uh, and that often most of the public does not know about. Um, letters to the editor are huge. That's obviously a bigger lift, uh, but incredibly important. That is an extremely um, highly read part of the newspaper, especially by legislators. And so if you can get a letter to the editor, or just do some social media on your social media, every bit of this makes a difference in, in getting the word out and helping people to understand why these rules are so important. Um, and then finally, defending against congressional attacks, and we'll support you with that, but just very quickly, there's something called the Congressional Review Act. Um, it allows Congress up to 60 days uh, um, prior to when some rule was passed to undo it. So that means next year's Congress could potentially undo some of these rules. That's part of the reason that we're pushing to have them happen quickly so that there is a less opportunity for an unfriendly Congress to uh, undo some of these rules in the future. And that's the Congressional Review Act. So I will pass it back to Madison. And again, thank you all very much for being here today. Thanks, Bill. One note real quick, there was some really good guesses at what is the first uh... The, for, the biggest source of greenhouse or carbon pollution in the chat. Do you want to reveal the answer? Well, I, I think I did, but let me re reiterate. Sorry. That the, the largest in the U.S., not, not globally, but in the U.S., are, is transportation. Thanks. Over to you, Madison, to talk about Congress. Thanks, y'all. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, uh, so to set the stage for what's happening in Congress, let's remind ourselves of the political landscape we're up against. If you could go to the next slide and you'll see some of our IPL friends in that previous photo um, doing some lobby visits on the Hill. Um, so I've, I've focused here uh, mostly on the House because that's where we've been encountering some of our biggest obstacles. Um, as you can see here, the Republican Party has a small majority. Um, so they don't have a lot of room to lose votes in their party. And 
Um, as we all know, there has been a small faction of GOP members who have been causing quite a stink and ultimately dividing the Republican Party in the House. Um, and so this really strong divisiveness, along with an even smaller Democratic majority in the Senate, has made legislative action um, particularly challenging. And I think really important to emphasize all the more reason administrative rulemaking is, is of the utmost importance in this, uh, in this uh, particular time. If you go to the next slide. Um, with all of that in mind, um, let's talk about the current status of the federal budget and why it matters for our work. There's a lot happening here. Um, and uh, I think it's important to emphasize that as people of faith, we care about the budget because we believe budgets are moral documents. How we spend our money reflects our values as a nation and our faith traditions call us to care for our neighbors and protect our climate for current and future generations. Um, you've probably been hearing a lot about the budget recently. Um, last month, Congress passed a short-term funding package that will expire the first week of March. As a quick refresher, this is now the third short-term budget package, also known as a CR, that Congress has passed since the original funding deadline this past September. So by the time that Congress revisits the short-term budget in March, um, the fiscal year will have passed about halfway through. Um, and a lot has happened within the last several months in regards to the budget, as we all know, um, that even included a very chaotic and arduous process to find a new Speaker of the House. Now, in a traditional budget process, Congress passes 12 appropriations titles that make up the entire budget package. Last year, during one of the many budget fights, Republican lawmakers signaled alarming funding cuts in their FY24 interior bill, um, that included a significant reduction in funding for programs that protect wildlife, fight climate change, keep our air clean, and protect public health. They even went as far to cut um, or to propose cuts to the EPA um, at its lowest levels in more than 30 years and um, completely eliminated several environmental justice programs. If you could go to the next slide, please. So thinking about what's at risk in the budget, um, it's not only agency funding, but also IRA funding, um, all of these huge wins that a lot of our communities here, people of faith have fought for to advance climate action are at risk um, in, in this budget process. And of course, um, not only uh, in environmental justice programs and other key programs, but the, the threat of a government shutdown and the implications that would have for a lot of the programs that we work with and, and would directly impact uh, some of our communities. Um, next slide, please. So when thinking about how to communicate um, how to uh, advance a good budget, we're working with Congress and, and urging members of Congress to pass a clean budget. Um, you may hear a terminology called poison pill riders being thrown around in this discussion. Um, these are often policy priorities that members of Congress have um, that they'd like to attach to the budget that may not get passed otherwise. Um, this past year, we saw a lot of anti-environmental and climate policy or poison pill riders attached in the budget process, and we don't want to see that um, uh, continue. Um, we want to see a clean budget so the budget can, can do its job as it is. Um, and then also, ultimately, of course, protect the IRA funds and other climate justice funding in the budget. And move on to the next slide. Have a lot of ground to cover, so apologize, apologies moving fast. Um, another bill that is a must pass legislation this year is the Farm Bill. Um, every five years, Congress proposes a Farm Bill, which is a multi year legislative package. The Farm Bill authorizes spending levels for various programs relating to agriculture, impacting both domestic and global agriculture priorities. These priorities not only affect individuals and communities across the country, but also plays a significant role in our overall impact of the environment. Next slide, please. As you can see, um, here is a helpful chart um, that shows uh, the transportation um, uh, emissions, but also um, highlights the agricultural um, emissions in in the US, um, ag falls at 11% compared to other sectors. If you could go to the next slide. 
And then here, um, this is a chart from our friends at the Environmental Working Group. Um, it really demonstrates that uh, compared to every other sector, the U.S. emissions are actually on the rise versus every other sector are starting to see a decrease in emissions. And so this particular farm bill is a really important opportunity um, to really champion climate smart uh, solutions so to help us overall reduce our emissions. Um, we also in our farm bill work wanna make sure that in, in promoting climate smart practices, we're also protecting farmers and better serving our communities. Um, we know that farmers are often on the front lines of climate change and wanna have the adequate support and resources uh, to as we um, encounter our ever changing climate. And you know, this is this time is really urgent. Um, uh, our communities and farmers are, are suffering now and, and waiting another five years for adequate climate smart resources um, is not something that we can wait for in the next farm bill. If we go to the next slide. Um, also want to note that we do have an action that you can use um, that we'll put in the chat where you can contact your members of Congress uh, to urge them for a climate smart farm bill. But in terms of where the farm bill is at the moment, um, the previous iteration of the farm bill, which was passed in 2018, it expired this past September. Um, it uh, at the same month as our last fiscal year, um, and in November, the 2018 funding levels were extended for one year. Um, so right now, the House and Senate Ag Committees are working to um, are continuing to work on the farm bill. We're hoping to see legislative text um, early in the spring, but also fully recognize that um, the budget process and another some other big priorities in Congress may continue to impact the farm bill's ability to get passed. All right, moving on to the next slide. Lastly, um, we wanna highlight a bipartisan bill that we are supporting called the Forest Act. This is a really exciting bill because it is bipartisan and it helps us advance some of our international climate goals. Um, research shows us that deforestation accounts for about 10% of the world's annual greenhouse gas emissions, with nearly 40% of all tropical deforestation coming from the result of illegal clearing. And the Forest Act essentially makes it illegal to import goods from deforested land. Um, it's uh, fairly comprehensive. It covers a lot of ground. Um, and we uh, will put some resources in the chat and an opportunity to sign on to a letter being led by our friends at the Sisters of Mercy um, for both uh, local state and national signers. So please uh, check that out. Um, but for the sake of time, um, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Eileen, who is our clean transportation organizer. Thank you so much, Madison. I'm so happy to hear everyone who guessed correctly that transportation is the number one source of carbon emissions here in the United States. My name is Eileen McKeevers, and I'm the newly minted clean transportation organizer here at the National Office of Interfaith Power and Light. And let's talk about some auto and trucking companies. Um, I want to highlight our auto accountability campaign where we work on both the light and the heavy duty side of transportation, using the faith voice to call on these companies, specifically Toyota and GM, to commit to 100% electric vehicles by 2035, or otherwise commit to supporting this transition to electric transportation. I want to highlight this super cool photo of Reverend Susan Hendershaw and one of our great guests. This is in Plano, Texas, where last April we delivered this very scroll with about 16,000 names on it to uh, Toyota Motor North America headquarters in Plano, Texas, um, showing that faith groups absolutely are interested in seeing Toyota produce electric vehicles and commit to electrification. So with this campaign, we also have a specific focus on affordability and accessibility. So making sure that electric vehicles and electric transport in general is really in reach for everyone. Also, we're prioritizing the inclusion of workers, communities, and indigenous groups and their needs as we go forward in this transition so we don't leave anyone behind. 
If we can move on to the next slide, I will talk a little bit about General Motors. So General Motors is one of our main targets. Essentially, with General Motors, we're calling on them to keep their promises to their consumers and to the general public and to follow through with their duty as a manufacturer. So as I mentioned on the last slide, our target as Interfaith Power and Light is to get auto companies to commit to 100% electrification by 2035. General Motors actually has committed to this goal. So you might think, well, okay, we're done then. You achieved your goal, so that's a win, right? And you're partially correct. It is a win. But on the other hand, GM has a pretty long history of not following through with their electric vehicle promises. They promise to uh, produce 400,000 EVs by 2024, and that is not happening. They've recalled that promise. They've rescinded it. They discontinued the Bolt EV um, to move it to their new battery platform, which really has left a big gaping hole in their electric vehicle lineup um, for a small passenger vehicle that's really accessible for anyone. And in addition, on top of all of those things, um, General Motors also hides behind industry groups, specifically the Alliance for Automotive Innovation, um, which lobbies on their behalf and in their name against those clean car standards that Bill discussed earlier. I want to make really clear that those standards are life and planet saving. They are actively lobbying against those standards that really are crucial to protecting communities across the country. So that's kind of the situation with General Motors. If we could move to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about Toyota. So our other main target is Toyota. And compared to General Motors, Toyota is very much an EV laggard. And that might be surprising to you because Toyota was a first mover in the hybrid space with their Prius, which actually came out about 25 years ago. And at the time, was a huge innovation in the passenger transportation space. And while we respect that hybrids were a big innovation at the time, it's been 25 years and we see more and more people, businesses and houses of worship ready to go 100% electric, not only for the planet, but for themselves and the personal benefits, the cost savings and the air quality benefits that um, you know, drivers want. Uh, Toyota also has lobbied very heavily against clean car standards. They have submitted public comment um, in their own name, saying essentially that these clean car standards are not feasible and that they're just out of reach for automakers, which we know is frankly blatantly false. And again, life-saving standards that they are lobbying against. They also sided with the Trump administration to sue California to roll back their ability to set more stringent and robust clean car standards. And those clean car standards also help move the nation farther than those national standards. So to combat all of these things that Toyota is engaging in, we launched our Toyota Driver campaign last year. Firstly, thank you so much to everyone who sent in your Toyota story. We saw a lot of stories from people who have had three, five, even seven Toyotas in their family and in their personal history who are ready to go electric. And it's important to illustrate that Toyota has cultivated really strong brand loyalty and we want to illustrate that their loyal customers are switching to other brands because Toyota simply doesn't make a car that fits their needs anymore. We had so many people saying that, yeah, I've owned five Priuses and I'm finally ready to go all electric. And Toyota's, excuse me, Toyota's electric vehicle options, which is currently just one fully electric vehicle, the BZ4X, is not cutting it. It's not available very widely. There's very low and limited inventory and the charging and range aren't very compelling. So essentially we're letting Toyota know that not only are people of faith ready to go electric um, for the planet, 
they're ready to go electric in their personal lives and they want Toyota to step up and do the right thing. So that is my spiel on auto accountability. There is one more thing I will mention though that is really critical in our electrification transition, Tiffany. Great, thank you. So the big thing is that we have a new policy position on our website, which is about electric vehicle batteries. This basically explains our position on battery minerals and how we see that we can electrify our transport system, again, without leaving communities behind. So essentially, we advocate for automakers to use their pur purchasing power to leverage for more sustainable, sustainably produced minerals. Um, we also 100% stand behind and advocate for FPIC, which is an industry term that stands for free prior and informed consent. It was originally created by the UN um, that basically states that communities and indigenous groups, anyone impacted directly by mining, should have the ability to give their free prior and informed consent in order for a project to move forward. This is something that has been historically lacking in the mining industry. Um, for those that don't know, the last major uh, mining legislation in this country dates back to about 1872. And if I'm correct, that should be before all of our collective lifespans. <laughs> um, so it's just a little bit out of date. Uh, so we, of course, advocate for general mining reform, reform of that legislation, and um, also, of course, for automakers to produce smaller and more efficient vehicles, which allows for less battery minerals to be used, as well as, you know, new electric vehicle battery technologies, which are allowing us to move away from the most problematic minerals like cobalt. So please check out that policy position if you're interested in uh, minerals or the supply chain and supply chain transparency. That is all from me today. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll pass it over to Mike to talk about our voter campaign. Thank you, Eileen. Hi, friends. My name is Mike Kennedy, and I manage our Faith Votes campaign. I doubt I'm the first person to tell you that there are some elections coming up this year. And uh, this election season is certainly about the values shaping our future. Together, as people of faith and conscience, we can protect our sacred earth and create a better world for current and future generations. We can do this by joining together to vote our values and make a difference. In our past two voter campaigns, IPL volunteers like you have personally encouraged over a million faith voters to vote their values, and we're thrilled to build upon that good work. This nonpartisan campaign equips congregations to mobilize their people and their neighbors to express their values through voting. Today, I'm going to preview some tools we'll provide for faith communities to connect with voters. Next slide, please. This election, your members and neighbors can commit to turning out to vote and to being informed about their entire ballot. IPL is partnering with Ballot Ready to provide a one-stop information platform for voters. Voters can access Ballot Ready by entering their name and address into a form like this on IPL's website in either English or Spanish. Next slide, please. The form then takes them to a page like this one where they can check if they're registered to vote at their current address, who and what is on the ballot, when and where they can vote in person, and how to get a mail-in ballot if they want one. They can also view IPL's voter guide, which I'm going to tell you about more about in just a moment, and they can even pledge to vote. Congregations and individuals can get a unique link from us that will allow them to see how many voters they mobilized. That feature is especially helpful for faith communities who are curious if their get out the vote efforts are having an impact. Next, please. 
We're going to encourage faith leaders to offer messages that preach and teach the importance of voting through the lens of faith. Our Matter of Faith guide will provide message starters, litanies, blessings, and more that can be used in worship and community gatherings. Our politic, pardon me, our politics in the pulpit guide will ensure that faith communities have the information they need to confidently conduct election-related activities within the bounds of federal rules and regulations. I saw some of our friends in Texas with us today, and we want to thank our affiliate there, Texas Impact, for their help on these resources. Next slide, please. We'll also have a congregational toolkit that is going to provide how-to guides. One example is a guide on how volunteers from a congregation can staff a table that provides voter info to members of their community in the weeks leading up to an election. Next, please. And IPL will again offer its multi-issue Faithful Voter Reflection Guide, available in print and online. The guide helps educate people of faith and conscience about issues that are at stake in this year's elections, allowing us to examine how our spiritual and our religious beliefs can and should be serving the greater good. So whether you use it at the kitchen table or in a house of worship or at a community forum, or even at an event with political candidates, we hope this guide will help you and your community navigate the urgent moral questions facing our nation. And next slide, please. Here are some other highlights of the campaign. Because voter registration is critical to a functioning democracy, the, the campaign's also going to expand the electorate by registering more voters. We plan to run a targeted digital ad campaign to reach a half million voters. And these are going to be ads that lift up inspirational stories of people of faith who are voting their climate justice values and encouraging their communities to vote. And finally, the campaign is going to train volunteer leaders to engage in this work so they can do it this year, but also continue it after this year. These tools are all coming soon, and you'll be among the first to know when they're ready. We're also going to work closely with IPL's affiliates in Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin to help them work with in-state partners and volunteers to do this work. So with that in mind, it's my pleasure to introduce Alexander Malko from Faith in Place, who's going to give you the down low on Wisconsin. Over to you, Alexander. Thank you, Mike. If you're like me, you feel like I need a collective breath from all that wonderful information that was provided before me. So I just want to give a big shout to all my co-panelists. I work here and I'm like, whoa, there's so much I learned. So um, just really, really a great shout to all your great work. Um, so today I really want to talk to you about Wisconsin. And it's not just a state, but really a pivotal battleground that commands national attention, especially in presidential elections. So I want to begin by recognizing the critical role of Wisconsin's 10 electoral votes. History has really repeatedly shown us how these votes have been decisive in tight races in 2000, 2004, uh, 2016, and in 2020. And this really underscores the state's unique position in reflecting the nation's political pulse. Um, and understanding the strategic significance really leads us naturally to consider the unique demographic and political landscape, which plays a key role in these electoral outcomes. The state at large really presents a fascinating tapestry of voters from a range of urban centers like Milwaukee and Madison, where I'm based out of, but calling in from the Kettle Moraine Hills currently. Um, these suburban counties around our major metropolitan areas that often tip the scales, which really positions and puts Wisconsin as a state for the broader political landscape. And recent legislative initiatives have emerged in this landscape, shaping the future of our electoral processes. Uh, part of my work is focusing on legislation on a state-based level. And through Assembly Bill 415, uh, the state is really aiming to establish a new procedure for legislative redistricting, uh, seeking to ensure fairness and adherence to constitutional and federal laws and uh, districts. And Wisconsin has historically had one of the most gerrymandered states in the country. 
This is, if of interest, the Clark versus Wisconsin case that's still unfolding uh, live. Uh, so I can talk with you more about that. But for the uh, depth of this presentation, additionally, looking at Senate Bill 685, which really proposes significant changes in managing absentee balance, uh, counting locations, election night reporting. It provides uh, whistleblower protections for municipal clerks, uh, among other election related procedures. And these bills really reflect a commitment to enhancing the integrity and transparency of Wisconsin's electoral system, which we've seen uh, cast out across the country as a laboratory uh, for investigation amongst other states as well. Uh, and again, you know, given this backdrop, the state really has become a focal point for major national issues as well, such as climate justice, a topic that really does gain prominence during presidential campaigns. Um, Candidates often come through Wisconsin acknowledging its importance. This really provides a unique platform to elevate the conversation on the issue. Um, Faith in Place, uh, the IPL affiliate working in Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin is gonna leverage this attention through various means. We're gonna use town halls. Uh, we're gonna have direct dialogues with candidates. Uh, we're gonna be running social media campaigns, highlighting our state's environmental challenges and potential solutions. And interestingly, too, the prominence of our state is really going to be put on the national political scene. And this is going to be further exemplified by the selection of Milwaukee as the host city for the 2024 Republican National Convention. Um, of note, this event is a historic event. Uh, the convention runs from July 15th through the 18th. There's going to be over 50,000 delegates and guests that will gather to nominate the future president and Vice President of the United States. Um, the convention is not only a significant political event, but also a tremendous opportunity for Milwaukee and Wisconsin to showcase their importance uh, and put that on that national and global stage for individuals. And as I kind of been talking about elevating issues, I also want to look at a bit into specific races, referenda, and ballot measures that will be pivotal this year and what we'll be doing uh, in the state. Uh, so in 2024, Wisconsin really includes highly competitive gubernatorial and congressional races, each with significant implications for overall state policy. Uh, there's local ballot measures on various environmental policy and community development are crucial areas in which will be um, inducing voter engagement. And these races really underscore the fact that our state is not just a battleground, but also a place where national discourse can be shaped and influenced. Um, I want to put this reminder forward again, as I uh, entered into the Zoom space, that four out of the last six presidential elections in Wisconsin were determined by less than a percent. So you can really see the direct importance of the work that we're doing here at IPL and at Faith in Place, and we're very excited to see uh, in the new year. And again, this really just doesn't highlight the state's electoral significance. It also presents an opportunity to make climate justice a national conversation starting right here in Wisconsin. Um, so with this opportunity comes a need for effective get out the vote tactics tailored to our unique uh, landscape as I highlighted earlier. So in 2024, our approach is gonna be multifaceted. We're gonna be doing community events, partnerships with local faith groups, that robust social media strategy. And then the aim is really not only to reach voters but also to educate and motivate them, uh, especially in those underrepresented communities. And one of the key events that embody our approach to civic engagement is going to be our 2024 Advocacy Day. This is set on March 21st, 2024, and the event is going to be a real cornerstone of our efforts. It's going to provide resources, training, uh, and advocacy to really empower Wisconsin residents to make a difference. Uh, we're going to be focusing on a core range of issues, um, including social justice, environmental stewardship, and highlighting how these are not just local, but also national concerns. So I just wanna offer this year in, in conclusion um, that really Wisconsin is really just more than a state. It's, it's a lens in which we can view and influence the broader political narrative in our country. Um, we have a diverse electorate and a really critical electoral role in the hosting of the 2024 Republican National Convention um, was purposeful, right? So it's a, really a beacon that guides the direction of our national dialogue and really puts importance to this pressing issue of climate justice. So I, I wanna thank you for um, your time and I appreciate it. And with that, I wanna pass uh, over to Tiffany. 
Thanks, Alexander. So um, we did a great, a good job team staying on schedule I, I, with all of that content. Um, we have about 10 minutes for Q&A and I saw a whole bunch of folks, lots of questions coming in. Um, and I wanna thank uh, Mike and Micah here on our team for helping to sort of organize those for us. Um, so I'm gonna start uh, sort of directing, reading off some of those questions and I'll direct them to the person who I think maybe can best answer them. A uh, couple, lots of questions um, on Toyota. So Eileen, over one on you, a uh, question about has Toyota signed onto the California emission standards? Yeah, um, no, <laughs> no, Toyota has done no such thing. Um, and they are, they did currently, um, they are, they currently lobbied against the round of clean car standards, the proposed rule that was released last year, um, the final rule of which we are expecting here in the next two months. So no, Toyota has not signed on to these uh, standards. Thanks, Eileen. And a follow on question for that is a question about uh, Toyota has a hydrogen powered vehicle. Um, could you speak to the hydrogen, their hydrogen powered transportation that does that get at sustainability goals? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I get this question pretty frequently. And to that, I say, um, as I once heard another EV advocate say that if we were about 10 years in the past, we absolutely could have been looking into hydrogen. But at this point, it really seems like that moment for national adoption of hydrogen vehicles is passing us. Um, the Toyota Mirai, which is Toyota's hydrogen vehicle, is only available in California because that's the only place in the country where there are any chargers. And while the EV charging infrastructure of this country definitely needs a build out, especially in low income communities of color and rural areas. It's significantly more robust than a charging system that only has charging stations in one state. And the amount of work that it would take to make up is really not able to be achieved at the pace that we need to electrify. Thanks, Eileen. Let me just add to that too, that we we have a statement, a policy statement on hydrogen. So if people are interested, they can find that on our website under the policy statements. Um, and we have a little bit of detail there. Yeah, that would be great. That's a, that's a great reference um, and has a lot more uh, detail on that. It's a, it's a big topic. <laughs> so it can, can dig, dig in there. Um, another question I'm going to jump to, and I think Madison, this might be for you, uh, is a question about the Supreme Court ruling on the Chevron standard and what impact that might have. The question is specifically about what impact it might have on all of these regulations that <laughs> I think a lot of the ones that Bill talked about and EPA's ability to uh, move them forward and regulate them. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's a big question, and I'm glad that someone brought this up because um, I think if we had more time, we would have covered that a little bit more. Um, for folks who may not be super familiar, there was a Supreme Court case. Um, there was an oral argument uh, before the Supreme Court, uh, I think, last week um, uh, that addresses this legal um, uh, precedent called the Chevron deference, which ultimately gives agencies the authority to implement um, and uh, enforce regulations. Um, it's a very, that is a super, super simplified version. Um, and uh, the Supreme Court is revisiting um, the uh, implications of this, uh, of this precedent and is likely considering to repeal it, which would, as is, was mentioned, would have pretty severe implications for our um, agencies to actually enforce these regulations that we have been so, um, uh, wonderfully advocating for. Um, and I am not a legal scholar, so I cannot go um, give a full uh, bodied picture of, of those implications, but I think it definitely is worrisome about our, um, about the progress that uh, we have fought for and are continuing to fight for. Um, we will continue to track the, the legal implications of the case. Um, and there is actually another Supreme Court case that would, um, 
uh, affect the EPA's ability to um, uh, enforce the good neighbor rule. So two really big Supreme Court cases at the moment that would impact our work. Um, so keep an eye out for more information um, about that from us. Um, but several of our partners are following it as well. But if you have specific questions and want to follow up, I'll put my email in the chat um, and feel free to reach out there. Thanks, Madison. Some big cases coming up, anxiety-inducing cases coming up. Um, I'm going to pivot us to a meth the methane topic. So I think this is a question for Bill. Question about um, methane described as waste, quote, waste. Um, is there an economic benefit to capturing it? Uh, yeah, I mean, there there is an economic benefit to capturing it because if you capture it, then you can sell it and it has value. Um, so there's that economic benefit. There's also an economic benefit to all of society to capture it, because if you don't, it goes to the atmosphere and it has that 80% greater global warming potential over 20 years than even carbon dioxide does. Thanks. And also a follow up on that. Could you share the access to the draft rule? I think might have we might have already shared and we'll be sending out in the follow-up, but um, if you could drop that in the chat, that would be great. Okay. Request for that. Um, back uh, over to you, Eileen. Uh, so question on transportation. So, and perhaps maybe Bill also. Uh, the question is, what organizations are resisting the implementation of stronger, stricter clean transportation standards? Folks want, name, want you to name names. <laughs> oh, I'll name names. Uh, I actually answered this in the Q&A section, but for those who may not have seen that, um, one of the biggest uh, lobbying groups is the Alliance for Automotive Innovation. They uh, represent a number of big automakers like Ford and GM, um, and they are lobbying pretty strongly against these uh, clean car standards. On the heavy duty side, we have the California Trucking Association. Really quickly, I will say that one of our bad actors of the past, the uh, Truck and Engine Manufacturers Association, cut a deal with the California Air Resources Board not to explicitly lobby against regulations. Um, but the California Trucking Association signed no such deal, hence are going forward with significant lobbying efforts. Thank you for naming the names. Um, one last question I think we can squeeze in and another question for Madison on the farm and on this farm bill related. Um, is IPL doing anything to promote regenerative, regenerative agriculture? Yes, absolutely. Um, such a good question. There are several marker bills that we have been supporting, which um, are small pieces of the farm bill that we hope to see in the full legislative text, um, all of which that support um, climate smart practices, um, particularly um, some USDA programs that provide funding for farmers wanting to implement climate smart practices, including regenerative agriculture um, and uh, a few others that uh, is slipping my head. Uh, but I'd be happy to um, send some additional materials if folks are interested. But um, uh, one of those bill, one of those programs is the Equip uh, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program um, that directly supports farmers um, in uh, practicing climate smart agriculture. It's really really great program um, and want to make sure that it's uh, fully supported in the farm bill. I could go on and on, but I'll keep it there because of time. <laughs> Thanks, Madison. And thank you all for joining us today for this important conversation and for all the work you're doing in your communities and with your members of Congress and in your states and your congregations and with your state affiliates and the partner groups who are on here today. Uh, we will send out all of the links shared or the links that we dropped in the chat will go out to, uh, and we'll send out a recording to everybody that's registered. So feel free to share that. And if you have more questions, feel free to reach out to anybody here. Thank you all.